Welcome to Human Monsters. This is part two of the Satanic Panic, the McMartin case, volume two. October 1985. The trial of Michael Ruby began. The gallery was populated with parents of the alleged victims, friends, and family of Michael Ruby and members of the press. The victims Michael Ruby was accused of abusing ranged in age from five to seven. There were five of them. The allegations had it that they were assaulted between September 1983 and July 1984. One medical exam proved that one of the girls was definitely sexually assaulted in the past, though it was not proven from a scientific standpoint that Michael Ruby was the offender. The plaintiffs were shown a model of the Manhattan Ranch preschool and asked to point out where the washrooms were. They did so without experiencing any PTSD flashback symptoms. It was also noted that Emma Jameson, who once described lewd acts of sexual abuse visited upon her by Michael Ruby, did so with no emotion, as if retelling them by rote, as if reciting something she was coached to say. Usually when victims of sexual assault recount the incident, they find it difficult and often cry. Incredibly, the same girl who claimed to have suffered an unmentionable abuse by Mike Ruby stopped when she saw him at the defendant's table. She said, aren't you Mr. Mike? Unsure as to whether he should answer at first, Ruby remembered his manners and said, indeed, I'm Mr. Mike. Starstruck, Emma said, I know you. You're on TV. It's quite rare when a victim of pedophilia reacts to the abuser like they're a movie star, isn't it? If the allegations were true, isn't it more likely that she would have shrunk away as she passed by and ran away crying? The gambit of getting the victims to examine the model house worked out better for Ruby's lawyer than he anticipated. Carla, Emma's mother, rushed Emma out of the courtroom so that she wouldn't do any more damage to the flimsy case that was being brought against Michael Ruby. His attorney emphasized that the charges were laid before substantial evidence was found. Michael's lawyer pointed out many inconsistencies of Detective Hogue and District Attorney Hart's assertions. On October 11th, 17-year-old Michael Ruby took the stand. He was questioned by his lawyer to find out what kind of young man he was. At his worst, he got into a few fights and gave minimal effort in school. He took the job at Manhattan Ranch to pay for his car. He hadn't an inclination to befriend or care for children. He took the job because it was available and it was offered to him. He copped to breaking snails in front of the children, but not to killing rabbits and forcing toddlers to drink their blood. District Attorney Hart tried the manipulative interrogation tactic called the Reed Technique. It consists of using presumptuous language so that you give the impression that you know what they've done and they'll take the bait and admit it, presumably. One example was this question posed to Ruby. When you touched Emma's vagina, did she cry? He may only have been 17 years old, but he was too sharp to fall for this. He said, well, ma'am, I never touched Emma's vagina, so no, she did not cry. She asked him, you slipped into the washroom when the three girls were in there, didn't you? No, ma'am, not at all true. Hart posed several questions regarding graphic details of sexual abuse that would have made Larry Flint blush. 
Hart's assumption of Michael Ruby as guilty, naive, and stupid was not commensurate with reality. Michael's lawyer objected to the use of trick questions to obtain a confession, and it was sustained by the judge. Hart was left with no other recourse but to bring her questioning of Michael Ruby to an end. November 5, 1985. 66 witnesses took the stand. Specialists, advisors, educated authorities, parents, guardians, children, teachers, citizens of Manhattan Beach. Yet, no decisive conclusions were made. All that remained at this point were the closing arguments by the attorneys. Hart accused Michael Ruby of abusing the power of his position as instructor to sexually abuse female children. Hart did concede that one of the girls gave a testimony that was confounding and inconsistent. She recalled the testimony of one Dr. Gail Goodman, a clinician at the University of Denver. Hart said, Dr. Goodman confirmed that small kids review huge occasions in their lives yet are much of the time befuddled while describing the subtleties of those occasions. Thusly, regardless of whether their revelations need reasonableness, it doesn't mean they are false. She also cited the clinical assessment of pediatrician Dr. Diddy Berkowitz, which she considered to be unquestionable. Dr. Berkowitz affirmed that every one of these young ladies showed actual side effects that are typical in the aftermath of sexual maltreatment. Someone attacked these young ladies. She walked over to where Michael Ruby sat and loomed over him like an avian predator. She said, and each of the girls said it was Mr. Mike. Michael Ruby's attorney, Bill McCabe, went through every case, child by child, detail by detail. He argued that the so-called evidence was inconclusive. He said, in Dr. Berkowitz's own words, the term reliable with sexual maltreatment is certainly not a definitive finding. Dr. Berkowitz additionally conceded that the actual side effects the kids had were likewise consistent with non-demonic causes. He went on to say that there were so many discrepancies and inaccuracies in the victim's recall of the events that it was difficult just to discern what actually happened. McCabe concluded by saying, The proof recommends that nothing occurred. So if you're okay with sending this young man to prison for the rest of his life, a life sentence based on fantastical stories blended with unproven medical theories, then I can only say, God help us all. November 22nd. The jury foreman informed the judge that after a 13-day deliberation, They reached a stalemate on all 11 counts. The votes on each charge for guilty and then not guilty went as follows. Counts 1 through 4, 5 to 7. Count 5, 4 to 8. Count 6, 2 to 10. Count 7, 5 to 7. And counts 8 through 11, 6 to 6. The judge said to Michael Ruby, You're to get back to court on December 6th, as it is possible this case will be re-attempted. Outside, Lisa Hart said to the press, The head prosecutor's choice to retry this case will rest exclusively in the inclination of the parents. They would have to put their kids through another preliminary. I think the genuine issue is the injury their youngsters will go through by being brought back to court. December 6th, Michael Ruby was back in court. Lisa Hart announced the parents were not prepared to move forward with another trial. 
The charges against Michael Ruby were dropped. He was free. January 17, 1986. District Attorney Ira Reiner announced that he was dropping charges against five of the McMartin seven. Most of the charges were dropped, but those who were in prison remained there on one charge of connivance each. The evidence was so scant that the other charges could not be upheld. November 20th, 1985. The dependency court decided that Judy Johnson was unfit to look after her sons due to her mental illness. Steve and Debbie became their legal guardians. Ray Bucky reflected on how the case affected him personally. They've demolished my life. I've watched them ruin my mom and grandma's lives. I've watched them ruin my sister's vocation. I was simply beginning at that school. I hadn't decided what I needed to do throughout everyday life. But they've burned a scarlet letter on me that I can never get rid of. I won't ever understand what sort of life I might have had. I can't confide in individuals any longer since I've seen a lot of the legislative issues, the debasement, the outrage, and the ignorance. Giving an examination over to genuinely involved and undeveloped guardians by policing guidelines is a self-destructive mixture of supposed realities with blind fear. Where does any conviction come from but a presumption of truth or facts? In come the expressions of kids. Confidence for this situation comes from the expressions of children. Children clearly corrupted by grown-ups, yet coming from their mouths. Is any youngster's words their own, or are they a result of grown-ups who control their world? A kid can't lie, they say. And yet, a kid lives in a universe of pretend and fantasy. Somehow this case has developed into an acknowledgement of a center one can find in the onion of a kid's story, combined with purported actual proof. Sensibly, the actual proof should match the degree of the allegations. My insight, one might say, depends on my own attention to my honesty. Yet the actual real factors and rationale my psyche strolls upon can avoid reality. One should show the absolute absence of actual proof to help the allegations assuming the main wedge of understanding is to get into the shut entryway of ignorance. One should have the option to see the chain of occasions these youngsters went through that shaped their convictions. An outline of the pool of grown-ups will show their demeanor and activities that shaped their children. Jane Hogue and the Guardians should be displayed in the light as far as concerns them as plotters. CII was a power in energizing the conviction. However, to me, the fuel they provided was to a discharge that all alone had previously started and would have presumably filled in size without CII. Jane Hogue gave them the conviction at first, and from that point, the Guardians commonly became their own monster. Peggy Bucky spoke about her experience. I figure individuals on the planet need to realize this was a witch chase, that nothing occurred at the school, and this could happen to anyone. And because of this case, it has happened everywhere. And people need to realize that nursery schools are not places where children are being molested, raped, and sodomized. November 12, 1986. The McMartin attorneys launched their assertion that their clients were more the targets of injustice than the alleged victims. Attorney Andrew Willing said, Current realities illustrate an indictment group which has totally neglected to focus on its commitment to look for equity and which has lied and hoodwinked the court. 
Willing advocated for a movement to have the charges against Peggy Bucky dropped because of the indictments, quote, misleading of the entire legal framework. The movement in question was a 118-page document written by attorneys Willing, Dean Gitz, and Danny Davis. Glenn Stevens was a former member of this team and contributed to the movement. Among the data in the movement was Stevens' point that Chief Prosecutor Lael Rubin and other parties in her office orchestrated a connivance and other infringements of social equality. They further alleged that the DA was guilty of legal misconduct. Danny Davis recommended that Lael Rubin be removed from the case based on this history. It also came to light that she had an extramarital affair with a Supreme Court judge whose child had once been a student at the McMartin School. Davis felt that, on these grounds, Rubin had a conflict of interest. They also underlined the point that the hysteria was ignited by Judy Johnson, a woman who was formally diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. The legal proceedings were not yet over. Ray Bucky appeared in criminal court to request a reduction in his bail. Lael Rubin insisted it must remain at $3 million. She repeated her usual litany of allegations as her arguments for keeping him off the streets. Ray told the judge about how his family lost everything, except each other. He said, Your Honor, though I know I'm not at fault for these wrongdoings, I actually accept this is a case that should go to preliminary. Just through a total preliminary will we arrive at reality. Sir, the reality of my guiltlessness is all I have left, and the truth, to put it simply, will set me free. The judge didn't see it that way and denied the request to decrease his bail. During the same hearing, it was announced that Judy Johnson was found dead in her home. The coroner ruled that it was death by misadventure due to alcohol poisoning. This was mentioned because her testimony had been pivotal throughout the investigation and legal proceedings. After all, it was she who spearheaded the allegations. A pre-preliminary hearing was scheduled to decide if the case could proceed in court given this development. It was revealed that Jane Hoag suppressed some of the data regarding Judy Johnson's mental illness, which included two letters she had written in which she expressed beliefs that evil supernatural forces were conspiring against her. Even D.A. Rael Rubin did not receive this information until months after she began working on the case. Hogue had expressly forbidden anyone from making copies of the letters. Attorney Harry Sondheim was the head of the prosecutor's redrafting division. He was considered to be one of the best in his field. Referring to Judy Johnson as the foundation of the case, he conceded that her psychosis triggered a social contagion, what is referred to in Africa as jungle justice. Such vigilantism in Africa often involves physical violence. As previously mentioned, many of the McMartin parents openly considered this measure. The judge considered Judy Johnson and her mental condition to be unessential to the McMartin case. The preliminary hearing was scheduled for late spring of 1987. Some important new evidence emerged. Judy Johnson's personal effects were examined after she passed away. The McMartins and Buckies asserted that the first time Judy brought Mitchell to the McMartin school was on May 12, 1983, and that it was from this date forward that the indicators of emotional and physical distress consistent with abuse began to manifest. Yet, on March 26, 1982, she included a lock of Mitchell's hair in her journal entry and wrote, Brad pulls hair. Judy speculated in these writings that Brad was abusing Mitchell. She wrote on October 3, 1982, 
about the proprietors of a preschool called the Children's Place. They tried to reach her by phone several times, with no success. They were worried about Mitchell because he was always irritable and restless. They expressed that sentiment seven months before he was enrolled at the McMartin School. On March 2nd, 1983, she wrote, Brad yells at boys. On March 3rd and 4th, she wrote, Mitchell home and blood, though there was no supporting text to expound upon the implications. The McMartins and Buckies remember the May 12, 1983 drop-off of Mitchell so clearly because of the way it was done. Judy had not enrolled Mitchell in the school. They didn't know she was coming. She just dropped him off and walked away. It was certainly not in keeping with protocol. She also wrote on the May 11th space on her calendar that she would start Mitchell in a preschool the following day. Material from Judy's notes contradict what she reported to Detective Hogue. According to her July 1983 schedule, she reported her suspicions that Mitchell's bleeding rectum was a result of Ray Bucky sodomizing him on July 14th, almost a month before the date she reported to Hogue, that being August 11th. Judy noted that a relative named Kathy attended Virginia McMartin's birthday party around this time. The McMartins and Buckies did not recall a woman fitting her description attending the festivities. It also turned out that Ray Bucky was not Mitchell's instructor at the school, and there was no private contact between him and Judy. One Dr. John Byram was a therapist and specialized in schizophrenia and paranoia. He was given Judy's notes and asked for his evaluation. He started out by saying, Goodness, this is a coarse reading case. As a matter of some importance, she was a suspicious personality, which implies she was non-psychotic, totally functional, but shaky all the same. She anticipated rashly on the grounds that she was unable to acknowledge what she'd turn into. Subconsciously, she viewed herself as unsuitable and intolerable. And through her normal movement, the progressive death of a distrustful character, she turned her consideration remotely to an article, or for this situation, an individual, a man, similar to her better half who wasn't her significant other, or, all the more explicitly, the person who worked at her child's preschool, Ray Bucky. Then, at that point, when she recognized her objective, the object of her suspicion, it crystallized, and he turned out to be unequivocally what she needed him to be, a beast, or as she said, a lunatic. After her significant other left, she put herself at the focal point of a controversy, for it was better for her to be segregated or mistreated than to be ignored. Dr. Byram referred to a book called Somewhere a Child is Crying, which is about child abuse. Judy Johnson read the book and became paranoid about the possibility of her own sons being abused. Dr. Byram commented on this. It seems okay that any mother who thought her kid was dismissed or mishandled would seek such a book for answers, and it checks out that Judy, a jumpy character, would misinterpret, or would it be a good idea for me to say, misread its significance. She knew to some degree subconsciously that the wellspring of the issue determined in her own home but she settled on a cognizant choice to find that substitute with whom she had no profound connection. Simultaneously, her activities are beyond dubious, and in the event that anybody would be prepared to carry out such a plan, legitimizing their activities to bring about some benefit for what they saw to be a more noble end goal, it would be paranoia. One doctor, Judy Johnson, took Mitchell to 
gave a talk on dissociation and multiple personality disorder in the Costa Mesa study. And without naming Judy Johnson specifically, he said, whimsical, distanced, unmingled, and neurotic character types are expected to uncover charges of youngster sex maltreatment, notwithstanding absence of proof. It takes someone jumpy to keep on communicating doubt and to take the youngster from one specialist to another until somebody affirms that perhaps there is abuse. January 18, 1990. The jury delivered its verdict. Ray Bucky was pronounced not guilty on all counts. The judge wasn't satisfied with this. He announced a malfeasance on 13 counts and requested that Ray appear in court again at a later date so that the possibility of him being tried again could be considered. As Ray left the courthouse with Peggy, she said to the press, I've gone through a lot of hardship, and presently we've lost everything. My anxiety was for my child and how they've treated him, in light of the fact that my child could never hurt a child. July 27, 1990. Ray was tried again and acquitted again, due to the weak body of evidence brought against him. Finally, District Attorney Joseph Martinez dissuaded the courts from trying Ray Bucky a third time. To quote from his argument, These children have day-to-day -day routines to experience. They can't be McMartin kids for eternity. There's no sense in attempting this case once more. The proof won't change. Taking everything into account, the McMartin case is over. The McMartin case cost the taxpayers of the state of California $14 million. Adjusted for inflation, that is almost $33 million 2023 dollars. Ray Bucky was 32 years old at this point. In a statement to the press, he said, I know I'm guiltless. I've declared my guiltlessness since the very beginning. The fact that I wasn't found liable makes me fulfilled. It's all over. December 17, 1995. Following a series of strokes, Virginia McMartin passed away at the age of 80. December 15, 2000. Peggy Bucky died of natural causes at the age of 74. October 30th, 2005, 30-year-old Kyle Sapp, who had once been a student at the McMartin's preschool and accused staff of abusing him, wrote an article for the Los Angeles Times that began with, Please accept my apologies. He went on to say that he was eight years old in 1984 when he claimed to have been sexually abused by the McMartin Seven. He apologized to all seven of them. He gave a point-by-point -point description of the events as they transpired. This is the article in full. 21 years ago, a child then known as Kyle Sapp told police that he had been the victim of sexual abuse at the McMartin Preschool in Manhattan Beach. Sapp, who attended the preschool from 1979 to 1980, was eight when he first talked to authorities in 1984. He and hundreds of other South Bay children made allegations against the family who ran McMartin and against the employees who worked there. School administrator Peggy McMartin Bucky, her son Ray, daughter Peggy Ann, mother of Virginia McMartin, and three female teachers were accused of fondling and raping youngsters over a period of years and of threatening them with death if they told. The scandal eventually resulted in criminal trials against Ray and his mother.
By the time the trials came to an end in 1990, with acquittals and hung juries, McMartin was a household word. The case had turned into one of the longest and costliest criminal proceedings in U.S. history. By the spring of 1984, Kyle and scores of other children were talking about school employees who had drugged them and touched their genitals, made them play sex games in the nude, used them as models in kiddie porn, and forced them to watch pet rabbits, mice, and turtles being killed. By the time the trials began, more than three years later, many of these children's stories had grown even more bizarre. They now included being taken to local businesses or flown to faraway places to be molested in satanic rituals. Prosecutors feared that their case would be hurt by such testimony, and they dropped many children from the witness list. Others were pulled from the witness list by parents who worried about causing further psychological trauma. Ultimately, fewer than a dozen children testified at the trials of Ray Bucky and his mother. Kyle was not among them. Earlier, though, he had played an important role in moving the case forward. A police report had noted that his stories of abuse were so detailed and uninhibited that he would make an exceptional witness. The district attorney's office apparently agreed. Of 360 McMartin students who claimed to have been abused, just 41 were picked to testify at the grand jury and the preliminary hearing. Kyle was one of them. In the decade and a half since the defendants were set free, research psychologists have shown that it's easy to pressure children to describe bad things that never happened. False memories can feel real, though, not just for preschoolers, but for older children as well. But Sapp, now known as Kyle Zerpolo, says he never had false memories. He always knew his stories of abuse were made up. The adults at the McMartin Preschool, quote, never did anything to me, and I never saw them doing anything, he says today. I said a lot of things that didn't happen. I lied. Why? Now married and with young children of his own, he feels the need to explain publicly. My mother divorced my father when I was two, and she met my stepfather, who was a police officer in Manhattan Beach. They had five children after me. In addition, my stepfather has three older children. In the combined family, I'm the only one of the nine children he didn't father. I always remember wanting him to love me. I was always trying excessively hard to please him. I would do anything for him. My stepbrothers and stepsisters and a half-brother and half-sister went to McMartin. So did I. I only remember being happy there. I never had any bad feelings about the school. No bad auras or vibes or anything. Even to this day, talking about it or seeing pictures or artwork that I did at McMartin never brings any bad feelings. All my memories are positive. The thing I remember about the case was how it took over the whole city and consumed our whole family. My parents would ask questions. Did the teachers ever do things to you? They talked about Ray Bucky, whom I had never met. I don't even have any recollection of him attending the school when I was going there. The first time I went to CII, Children's Institute International, now known as Children's Institute Incorporated, a respected century-old L.A. County child welfare organization where approximately 400 former McMartin children were interviewed and given genital exams, and where many were diagnosed as abuse victims. We drove there, our whole family. I remember waiting for hours while my brothers and sisters were being interviewed. I don't remember how many days, or if it was just one day, but my memory tells me it was weeks. It seemed so long. It was an ordeal. I remember thinking to myself, 
I'm not going to get out of here unless I tell them what they want to hear. We were examined by a doctor. I took my clothes off and lay down on the table. They checked my butt, my penis. There was a room with a lot of toys and stuffed animals and dolls. The dolls were pasty white and had hair where the private parts were. They wanted us to take off their clothes. It was just really weird. I remember them asking extremely uncomfortable questions about whether Ray touched me and about all the teachers and what they did. And I remember telling them nothing happened to me. I remember them almost giggling and laughing, saying, Oh, we know these things happened to you. Why don't you just go ahead and tell us? Use these dolls if you're scared. Anytime I would give them an answer that they didn't like, they would ask again and encourage me to give them the answer they were looking for. It was really obvious what they wanted. I know the types of language they used on me. Things like, I was smart, or I could help the other kids who were scared. I felt uncomfortable and a little ashamed that I was being dishonest. But at the same time, being the type of person I was, whatever my parents wanted me to do, I would do. And I thought they wanted me to help protect my little brother and sister who went to McMartin. Later, my parents asked if the teachers took pictures and played games with us. Games like Naked Movie Star. I remember my mom asking me. She would ask if they sang the song, and I didn't know what she was talking about. So she would sing something like, Who you are, you're a naked movie star. I'm pretty sure that's the first time I ever heard that. From my mom. After she asked me a hundred times, I probably said, yeah, I did play that game. My parents were very encouraging when I said that things happened. It was almost like saying things happened was going to help get the people in jail and stop them from what they were trying to do to kids. Also, there were so many kids saying all these things happened that you didn't want to be the one who said nothing did. You wouldn't be believed if you said that. I remember feeling like they didn't pick just anybody. They picked me because I had a good memory of what they wanted and they could rely on me to do a good job. I don't think they thought I was telling the truth, just that I was telling the same stories consistently, doing what needed to be done to get these teachers judged guilty. I felt special, important. It always seemed like I was thinking. I would listen to what my parents would say if they were talking, or to what someone else would say if we were being questioned at the police station or anywhere. And I would repeat things. Or if it wasn't a story I'd heard, I would think of something in my head. I would try to think of the worst thing possible that would be harmful to a child. I remember once I said that if you had a cut, instead of putting a band-aid on it, the McMartin teachers would put on dirt, then put the band-aid over the dirt. That was just something in my head that was bad. I just thought of it and told them. I think I got the satanic details by picturing our church. We went to American Martyrs, which was a huge Catholic church. Every Sunday, we had to go, and Mass would last an hour, hour and a half. None of us wanted to go. It was kicking and screaming all the way there. Sitting, standing, sitting, standing. What I would do was picture the altar, pews, and stained glass windows, and if... They said, describe an altar. I would describe the one in our church. Or instead of, there was a priest in a green suit, someone who was real, I would say, a man dressed in red as a cult member. From going to church, you know that God is good, and the devil is bad, and has horns, and is about evil and red and blood. I'd just throw a twist in there with Satan and devil worshipping. I remember going in our van with all my brothers and sisters and driving to airports and houses and being asked if we had been abused in those places. I remember telling people that the McMartin teachers took us to Harry's Meat Market 
and describing what I thought the market was like. I had never been in there before, and I was fairly certain I was going to get in trouble for what I was saying because it probably was not accurate. I imagined someone would say, they don't have that kind of freezer there. And they did say that. But then someone said, well, they could have changed it. It was like anything and everything I said would be believed. The lawyers had all my stories written down and knew exactly what I had said before. So I knew I would have to say those exact things again and not have anything be different. Otherwise, they would know I was lying. I put a lot of pressure on myself. At night in bed, I would think hard about things I had said in the past and try to repeat only the things I knew I'd said before. I remember describing going to an airport and Ray taking us somewhere on an airplane. Then I realized the parents would have known the kids were gone from the school. I felt I'd screwed up and my lie had been caught. I was busted. I was so upset with myself. I remember breaking down and crying. I felt everyone knew I was lying, but my parents said, you're doing fine, don't worry. And everyone was saying how proud they were of me. Not to worry. I'm not saying nothing happened to anyone else at the McMartin Preschool. I can't say that. I can only speak for myself. Maybe some things did happen. Maybe some kids made up stories about things that didn't really happen and eventually started believing they were telling the truth. Maybe some got scared that the teachers would get their families because they were lying. But I never forgot I was lying. My stepdad was a police officer who had guns in the house. I remember when all of this was coming down, he was put on a leave of absence from work because he was being investigated for supposedly threatening the McMartin family. He was cleared of that accusation. Apparently it wasn't true. But being only nine years old at the time, I thought my dad was saying he would kill the McMartins. So, in my mind, I figured no one from the school was going to dare mess with him because he would have hurt them first. That made me feel secure. It could be a reason I never mixed up reality and fantasy and always knew I was lying. But the lying really bothered me. One particular night stands out in my mind. I was maybe 10 years old and I tried to tell my mom that nothing had happened. I lay on the bed crying hysterically. I wanted to get it off my chest, to tell her the truth. My mother kept asking me to please tell her what was the matter. I said she would never believe me. She persisted. I promise I'll believe you. I love you so much. Tell me what's bothering you. This went on for a long time. I told her she wouldn't believe me, and she kept assuring me she would. I remember finally telling her, nothing happened. Nothing ever happened to me at that school. She didn't believe me. We had a highly dysfunctional family. We argued and fought all the time. My mother has always blamed anything negative on the idea that we went to that preschool and were molested. To this day, she believes these things went on. Because if they didn't, how can she explain all the family's problems? To this day, I can't open up with her about my personal problems. She's always asking me why I never do. That one night skewed our relationship. Once the case was over, it was just over in the past. The defendants were set free, and that was it. The kids' parents never asked, why were they innocent? Why were they unable to find evidence to convict these people? My family has not seen the movies or read the books questioning the prosecution. It's like skeletons in a closet that you just don't want to take back out. I'm the only one who ever brings the topic up and who admits nothing ever happened to me. I've said I lied about everything, but I've never gotten a real response from my mother and stepfather. It seems really strange seeing their reaction to the fact that nothing happened to me. If I had gone my whole life thinking my child was molested, I would be elated to find out that he or she wasn't. 
I'd like to think learning that your child was not molested would supersede anything. After all, all you have is your next day. It would be a shame to live the rest of your life thinking molestation had happened when you could think it didn't. McMartin is something negative in my life, and I'm trying to make it a positive. I've got two little kids I love dearly. They've changed the priorities in my life. My goal is to raise them as best as I can and try to lead by example. I want to be totally honest with them, to say, this is something that happened to me. I did something dishonest. Then at some point, I was able to be honest about it. I want my children to be able to come to me like I wish I could have with my parents. I'm a supermarket manager, and the thing I like best about my job is the interactions I get to have with customers' kids. I love talking and listening to them. I've been told I would be perfect for opening a children's daycare. That's very ironic. I would love to look at the defendants from the McMartin Preschool and tell them, I'm sorry. How and Why Kyle Came Forward by Debbie Nathan Debbie Nathan went into detail about how this article came about. I first heard from Kyle Zerpolo via email early this summer. He contacted me because I appeared in the documentary film Capturing the Freedmans, which he had just seen. Members of the Friedman family were accused of mass child molestation in Long Island, New York in the 1980s. Research I did years ago suggested that many or all of the allegations were false. And in the film, I talk about this. I also discuss the McMartin case. I looked into it while co-authoring Satan's Silence a book about the national panic over sex abuse in daycare centers and schools in the 1980s. Zerpolo found my website and wrote that he was chilled by the film's depiction of the Friedman family being destroyed by children's false accusations. It was basically the same as McMartin's. I did that. I feel very ashamed. Nothing he told police and prosecutors about being abused was true, he added. He had regretted it for years. Now he wanted to apologize to the defendants in person. I told Sir Paulo I wanted to hear his story. I also offered to put him in touch with the McMartin defendants. Some are dead, including Virginia McMartin and her daughter Peggy McMartin Bucky. Ray Bucky and his sister Peggy Ann, as well as a former McMartin teacher, Babette Spittler, declined to meet with Sir Paulo. They've always staunchly proclaimed their innocence and say they don't need apologies from former students who were children and couldn't help themselves. Peggy Ann has said that they would rather hear from the police, social workers, therapists, prosecutors, doctors, and parents who fueled the case. Sir Paulo says his mother and stepfather divorced years ago. I couldn't reach his stepfather, and when I contacted his mother for comment, she declined. Sir Paulo says she doesn't agree with his decision to tell his story. As for his stepfather, all Sir Paulo will say is that he's very ill. How Kyle's Story Snowballed James M. Wood a research psychologist at the University of Texas at El Paso, has studied the McMartin interviews done by Children's Institute International. Giving children dolls and puppets during a forensic interview encourages them to pretend and fantasize instead of sticking to facts, Wood says. When an interviewer refused to take no for an answer, this implies that another response is required even if it's not true. Saying that a defendant such as Ray Bucky is being followed by undercover police implies that the accused is dangerous and that the children should help lock him up. And, says Wood, telling children that everyone's talking about the crime creates conformity pressures that are highly improper. A few years ago, Wood did an experiment in which children were questioned using McMartin interviewing techniques. 
After two or three minutes, most of the kids started to make up bizarre stories. According to Maggie Bruck, a psychiatry professor at Johns Hopkins University and a researcher of children's memory and suggestibility, Wood's experiment and others have led to a consensus among psychologists. They agree now that CII's methods in the McMartin case were inappropriate. CII Senior Vice President Steve Ambrose says his organization is, quote, not in the business of promoting false allegations and never has been. Nick Martin was the first case of its type. Experts have learned a great amount since then about how to interview children about sexual abuse in ways that meet the needs of the criminal justice system. This remains very difficult but we're more sensitive now about making sure that the way we interview kids will stand up in court and that what we say will not be taken out of context. The following is a condensed transcript of a March 10th, 1984 CII interview with Kyle Sapp, now known as Kyle Zerpolo. Sapp was interviewed by two CII staffers. Kyle. Mr. Ray didn't work there when I was in there. Interviewer 1. What do you mean? Kyle. Yeah, he didn't go there. Interviewer 1. A long time ago, some of the kids said that there were some secrets from that school. Some crummy things happened. And um, we told them about our secret machine right here. And our puppets, who are real smart guys, like Mr. Snake here, Pac-Man. And um, we told him how smart our puppets were and how they helped kids talk about some stuff sometimes. And we've been playing detective. Kyle nodded. Interviewer one. We can talk about those secrets now, Pac-Man. And you can help, Kyle. Everybody's talking about it now. You know what? We're going to tell you one of our special secrets because we have a secret that we've been telling all the kids. And this one is, you're going to like this one, Pac-Man, because Kyle's dad is a policeman. We know that sometimes Mr. Ray was at that school. He wasn't a teacher then, but we know that he was at school. Do you remember that, Pac-Man? Kyle. He didn't work there, but I know that when another child was there, It happened. Interviewer one. Well, you know what? We know that even before Kyle was there, Ray was there. And we know that he was there when Kyle was there too. Kyle. They said on TV that he did something. Interviewer one. We know this about Mr. Ray. That sitting outside Mr. Ray's house is a special policeman in a regular car. He doesn't wear uniform or anything like that. But he um, sits in a regular-looking car outside Mr. Ray's house. He watches all the time. And if Mr. Ray goes out of his house, then the secret policeman follows him. He'll be right behind him, and he won't even know he's there. Think that's a good idea, Pac-Man? Kyle. Uh Uh-huh. Interviewer 1. We got a mountain of dolls here. Here's a little girl. Easy to tell she's a girl. She has a bow, and her vagina's underneath. Kids throw them, beat them up, and everything. You should have seen another child beating them up. Boy, we had a good time. Interviewer 2. Beating up Mr. Ray doll. Interviewer 1. And, um, let's see. I wonder, Pac-Man, if you remember any of the games that you used to play at that school. Kyle. Yeah. Interviewer 1. Yeah? Like, which ones do you remember? Kyle. Like, Mr. Ray, he would... He would get his camera, and then he... They would... They would... He would take their pants off, and... And then they would go in their pool, and they... Then he would take pictures. Interviewer 2. Your mom and dad already know that game... Because they heard it from other kids' moms and dads. Interviewer 1. 
Did any other teachers play Pac-Man? Kyle. Yeah. They took pictures, too. Interviewer 1. Oh, boy. Gee. We're really figuring this out. What a big help you are. My goodness. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.